Are we live? Google, are you working? Can you hear us, Google? I think we're on. I think we're on. Hello, this is TJ, and this is the Shark Tank Hangover, the only Shark Tank after party on the web. For all of you who love watching the show, and when it's over, you wish you had more people to talk to than just the person who fell asleep next to you on the couch. I'm here for you. This is TJ, host of the Shark Tank podcast, tonight with a lovely guest. She is a speaker, the owner of a flight attendant career connection, and the author of the Amazon bestseller, Make Money with Facebook Groups. Who doesn't love doing that? When she isn't helping aspiring flight attendants land their dream job of writing for the Huffington Post, she's encouraging women to live their effervescent life while realizing their limitless dreams. She and her husband, Jason, have three children, live in Disto Beach, South Carolina, and you can learn more about Abby and her buddy business at abbyunger.org or connect to be putting in the description below. Abby, welcome to The Hangover. How are you? Hi, I'm excited to be here. I'm another East Coast girl, so um, it's late, but I'm excited. All right, good. So hopefully you're only half hungover, but you probably couldn't tell I was reading that bio because it was just so professional. You're welcome. <laughs> and for those who are wondering, how did I find Abby? When I started my podcast about two years ago, Abby's one of the very first people that I got to know as a listener, and I've never forgotten her, and I definitely was honored to have her as a guest now on The Hangover. So it's nice to hang with you, Abby. Yeah, I'm excited. And your podcast was the very first podcast I ever listened to. When I started my business, I heard that you should listen to podcasts. So I started just sort of Googling around and I liked the Shark Tank. So you came up, started listening to you and you introduced me to Pat Flynn and a lot of other really cool people um, because you had them on your show. Awesome. Awesome. You were just Googling around. That should be in the Urban Dictionary. <laughs> I've been Googling around a few times. All right, so let's kick uh -oh. things off tonight. Um, you said some really funny words like effervescent. We might have to use those tonight in our discussion. Yes. But uh, it's episode six of season seven, and the first guys on there rented like a champion. And I was just sitting there going, Rudy, Rudy. Because <laughs> they're from that area near Notre Dame. Funny story, my parents knew Rudy Rudiger, and he would always talk about how the only thing harder than being Rudy was actually getting it made into a movie, much like Sylvester Stallone. So that was actually more difficult than going to Notre Dame and sacking the quarterback in the Georgia Tech game. So that's what I was thinking about while these guys were up there. And Rudy Rudiger is actually in the movie at the very end cheering for himself, which was kind of fun oh, trip. Nice. Um, so initial thoughts on these guys right here. Let's have it. Um, well, I like sort of in my bio said I travel industry background so anything that makes travel easier um i think is cool and interesting and one thing though i was kind of wondering about because with airbnb depending on the city some cities are coming out with ordinances sort of limiting this airbnb so i live outside of charleston south carolina in charleston you can't rent an airbnb for less than a month and they actually just recently did a sting on this lady where they um, they tricked her and they showed up. And as soon as she opened the door to rent her house out for less than a month, they gave her a ticket. So it was like this big, you know, sting. I guess all the criminals were already rounded up. <laughs> what? As well, they well, should do. I mean, who would use their in less than a month? Kind of I know. So they've kind of, I guess, because of the hospitality industry. So I'm wondering if they may end up running into something like this where either the government, the local, you know, especially in these small towns, either want to cut or they start limiting it because, you know, I don't know why, but that just is sort of the first thing that came to mind. And also, since this was the first time we saw the sharks, I thought Lori's dress was awesome. I just wanted to put that in there too because I'm on Facebook, that, people are always talking about Lori's freaking dress. Why that is that pop of pink? I was like, yes. And then later she stood up. Oh, it was, it was beautiful. What so about that was weird shirts? You didn't, you didn't notice Chris's shirts that he wears? A billionaire who wears those like rocking our ranch Western shirts? Oh, I know. Yeah, that was, yes. But I wasn't, I don't know. Just something about Lori and her dress. Like, of, yeah. She should have been wearing something like this. <laughs> she should, I know. <laughs> Give me five million bucks in the bank, and all I got is the truth. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> That's uh, true. All right, here's the deal. If someone, if you out there listening, if you use Uber, if you use Airbnb, if you use these services that are basically crowd sharing, uh, first of all, they're awesome. I use Uber and Airbnb all the time. And it's always fun with Uber, especially when you go to cities where they don't allow you to use it because you have to get around the rules. Eventually, they're going to get there. Like if you fly into Chicago, not O'Hare, but the other one, uh, you have to basically move your pin away. And there are a couple of airports I've had to do this. 
and you have to tell them to pick you up outside the airport. They call you and they come in and there are people watching for them. And then one day magically, it's like, oh, the rules are changed. We can do it now. But it's exactly for the reason you mentioned. They're disrupting established industries that have been around for a long time that are not cool with this. I saw an ABC 2020 where they did a interview about a guy in St. George who was Airbnb in his house and found out later it was against the rules. And then they interview the guy who's on the board that makes these decisions of the city. And oh, guess what? He happens to being in local St. George area. And he's sitting there with a straight face going, yeah, you know, we don't know who these people are and it's unsafe and they're not licensed. I'm like, if hotels were awesome, nobody would use it. Plain and simple. It's the market. I love it. So, um, I don't, yeah, I mean, they're going to have issues with that. But as far as the college games, you can't tell me in these small towns they mentioned like Auburn and Tuscaloosa and South Bend, they have anywhere near the amount of hotels they need to get all That's these. That's a good games. point too. Yeah. Otherwise, why would they be driving two hours to a hotel in traffic? Who wants to do that? So right. uh, I thought the idea was good. Initial observations, he said 49 million people go to a college football game every year and 70% of them need a hotel room. I'm from Arizona and our university is like 10 minutes away, so I didn't know that. That's insane to me. I think maybe it's those all-day-long tailgaters, but then they bring RVs. So what are your uh, thoughts on that? Is, do you ever Have you stayed in a hotel room for football? Um, no, <laughs> no, but I didn't, I didn't really have a traditional college experience. So I'm not, um, you know, life or going back to games and things like that. So no, but, um, I would like to buy a house near a college stadium now <laughs> so that I can run some people through it. Yeah, you just have to live there most of the time. It would be great. Yeah. I think man, this must be the sec because those people, they take it pretty seriously. I went to an LSU game when they That's, got blown yeah. by. We do Alabama. love football in the South. College football in the South is a big thing. <laughs> that's that's the thing. It's the only thing I think. Sorry, no offense, Southerners, but well, yeah, that's true. I mean, but and then when they were walking out and they sort of cut back in, they said, you know, hopefully it'll be acquired or maybe we can build it up big enough to get bought or something. And I'm wondering if the guys who this is their baby were, you know, on board with that plan, future plan, um, to maybe one day we'll get to sell it. When Troy Carter was on there, he, he said same thing. He's like, with their current valuation and the cash flow, it's a, it's a win-win. And they kind of did the same thing during this post game. I don't know. I thought T. Drew Mitchell and Mike Doyle were uh, pretty sharp. This guy, Mike, knew his numbers. I, I can't remember the last time someone could rattle off that many numbers that fast without missing a beat. That, that was pretty impressive. He said $1.4 million is what they made in fees on $6.1 million, uh, 6 million lifetime transactions, and they project this year to get 950000 in fees. That's pretty healthy. 8% fee to homeowners. Uh, I think he said it was a 17% fee to the users or maybe vice versa. And he mentioned they're buttering both sides of the bread. This had soccer written all over from the beginning, in my opinion. No, I, yeah, I mean, I agree. And then they got the deal. And of course, Mark Cuban is, you know, I don't know. That's who I'd want. I don't, I don't even have a product that would have a deal right now, but I think that would be pretty cool. So two good guys. Yeah, they kind of they kind of threw it at Mark, and nothing. I'm I'm. They must have cut something out because they kind of just skipped over it after that. Robert's concern: Why not Airbnb? Why don't they do this? I thought they answered that marvelously. Look, we actually go in the market and we get in these people's living rooms and we convince them that this is a good thing for them. Airbnb right. Do that. Uh, but I absolutely agree in the post game um, that. Uh, sorry, I got caught. Uh, I distracted there. In the post game, they said at that valuation with that kind of cash, it's a no brainer. And I'm sorry, Mark and Chris did share the deal, two hundred thousand for ten percent. And at the very end, they got greedy. They asked Mark to come to an Notre Dame game, and he told him to take a hike. I know. I thought they were almost going to lose it when they were like countering with a different school or something. It's like this is not the point. It's funny you do all this homework to go on the show, and you get exactly what you want, and then you make the mistake of asking Mark to come to an Notre Dame game when he's a Hoosier. That he he kind of that look of incredulity, like serious, really? Yeah, that's <laughs> the deal. Uh, but pretty funny. Uh, what was the other thing that stuck out to me on this? Kevin O'Leary, two hundred thousand for fifteen percent. Chris Saka, two hundred thousand for ten percent. Gave him exactly what they asked for, and um, and that was about it. Uh, the, the one thing I thought was interesting is Chris Saka has got a record for investing in pretty much anything that's made money in the last 10 years in tech, like all the big ones. He said he turned down Airbnb. I don't follow him that closely, but that was surprising because he was worried about the liability of having someone like get killed in one of his rooms and have that blood on his hands. Yeah. I mean, I can understand that. I mean, I think that that is something Airbnb has come a long way to re-educate the consumer. But of course, you know, the first time, 
your mom hears about Airbnb, she's like, oh my gosh, what if they kill you or lock you in the basement? Um, but now that it's become more normal and people are actually surviving their nights in Airbnb, I think that, you know, it's sort of that re-education has come a long way. So I don't even really remember before then, but I could imagine it was kind of like, you're going to let who stay with you where, um, kind of like hostels. Like we don't do hostels here in the U S right. and you know, it's like a scary movie is what it is here. And in Europe, that's where everyone goes. So it's just that. Yeah. Different. You're right. And you mentioned, you know, what if I get killed or something bad happens? I'm like, yeah, but you're getting such a good deal. Look at that view, you know, why you're being stabbed. How can you pass that up? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so anyway, I thought it was a great segment. I predict that they're going to roll with it for a while, whether it's a year or two years and they're up and they're all going to make a ton of money. And that's what I think is going to happen. And it's just going to be an add on service or specialty offering for college football fans. Uh, but great segment, awesome company. And I thought T drew and Mike were pretty solid uh, as far as their performance went. So good stuff. I agree. Thoughts on them. I agree. I mean, I think, I think it's cool. I think it's smart that they figured out a way to, you know, serve a market that was underserved in the living rooms of the, you know, consumer. Yeah. So I, you, let's talk about how much money there is in college football. I mean, these universities take in over a hundred million dollars a year. Uh, it's, yeah. it's under, how is it an underserved market is really interesting to me. So good on them for figuring that out. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. So this one, I don't know if you're a coffee drinker. I'm not, are you a coffee drinker? I am. Drinker? Yep. All right. I'm going to let you take run with this one because I, the first thing I thought is if I was going to drink coffee, I'm out. Thanks though. Uh, it kind of got weirder from there. So give me your first impressions. Okay. So the product I really was excited about, I'm still excited about it. Um, I think at first I thought it was going to be, I don't know if you've ever seen, but they make these, um, coffee things that, um, you sort of push a button and it causes this chemical reaction and it'll heat up the beverage or they serve meals like that. They sell meals like that too. That's what I thought it was going to be. But this is even cooler, I thought, because yeah, so like, I thought they were going to pop the top and it was going to be like the one from last year where there's a chemical reaction and it like immediately diffuses and heats the beverage, right? Yeah, that's what I thought it was going to be too, which I've, you know, and I've seen those before, but this was different. I mean, I, and then of course I was like, how is the can not going to burn your hand? But he seems to have figured it all out with his, what, $2 million for his insulated label. Um, but I think it's a really cool product. I guess that's sort of where I land. Um, with the with the K-Cup, you know, K-Cups have come a long way, again, re-educating the consumer to be like, you can have one fresh, hot, beautiful cup of coffee at a time. Wouldn't you rather have that than a big old stinky pot all day long on the warmer? And he's sort of riding those coattails where he can say, oh, look, it's a fresh, hot cup of coffee, can of coffee. Um, right at your fingertips whenever you need it. And it seemed to already have the sugar and milk and everything in it, which is pretty cool. Um, I was thinking that this would be neat on an airplane, like if an airline sold it, because it probably wouldn't be very hard to put the little warmer in the back galley. And they sell, they already sell sort of upgraded beverages anyways, besides alcohol, um, Red Bull and vitamin water, things like that. So the wa the coffee on an airplane is not usually not very good. So I think they, I think I don't know, I just, they can put all the other drinks in the same cooler or storage area that they'd have to have a special container, a special deal just for that hot shot beverage. But I like the idea. I think they could probably charge a crap. But, you know, they have um, old ovens that they're taking out because they don't serve meals anymore. So they probably have some of the, you know, capabilities. So wait a minute, these honey roasted peanuts aren't warm. Can you just walk back over there and heat those up for me? <laughs> Well, in the front, they still are sometimes in first class if they have an oven. It's true. It's very true. <laughs> um, so let's, we kind of skipped over the fact that he said hot box early on and one of the, one of the sharks giggled. I don't know who it was, but I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's the first time I've heard him reference a hot box uh, <laughs> on the show. So I thought that was funny. So show items here. I found it in Japan. Reminded me of you, Lace. I had Tim Talley on. He was a uh, trend spotter in Japan. He brought some, his idea over here, did really well with it. So as we know, the Japanese make great stuff, you know, the ShamWow. Uh, invested $2 million. This is where I went for the remote and I hit pause and I just kind of sat there and let that sink in a little bit. Like, wait a minute. You did what? You invested $2 million. Okay, so hopefully you've sold at least $2 million with. Nope, not so much. This to me is nuts. And it actually uh, 
Kevin would say it's a form of financial pornography, of uh, business malpractice, whatever his line would be. You can't allow people to think it's okay to spend six years and $2 million developing a product you haven't sold. It's just not all right anymore. Not in the tech economy. I forbid people to do this. Did that make your head spin at all? Um, yes. I think the six years, though, almost is more mind boggling than the $2 million because, well, first of all, I thought it was cool. I wrote this down that like Kevin said, if it doesn't make money in 36 months, then, you know, take it behind the barn and shoot it or whatever he said. But I was like, yes, okay, that's good. That's really, that's a great nugget for entrepreneurs, 36 months. And then you, you know, abort the, you know, abort the mission. But I think six years is so long to not make any money. Like it is, that's a long time. So $2 million invested, but what has he been doing for six years? I guess he lives with his parents maybe and works in the factory because his dad has that cool business too. Yeah, I don't but he know. pumped a half million dollars of his own money into this. I'm like, look, if you can get people you know and maybe people who aren't related to you to give you a million and a half, that's cool. But when you start putting a half a million dollars of your own money, it's not really cool. I mean, facetious, but $2 million, like if I get to $50,000 and I haven't made any money, I start rethinking. Right. Like, what's going and on and you're right in the tech you know the tech world or i mean there's just so many options now to raise money to pre-sell to do all sorts of things you're selling coffee like sell some people like coffee i don't drink it but a lot of people i know do like yeah. sell it. i mean you could do like a little cart like an ice cream cart around your neighborhood and sell some cans of coffee yeah you could you could hot box it all over town it's, <laughs> yeah it's you could <laughs> Uh, I've got Rob Merlino's Shark Tank blog here where he said that this guy had sunk a million bucks in Hotshot. Now we know it's two. He tried to get 100000 in funding on Kickstarter last spring, but he was unsuccessful. So here's someone okay. who spent $2 million, tried to raise hundred k and couldn't do it. That's a bad sign. Yeah. And as of, the date of this episode's original air date, the product is no longer available for sale. So this is like the night you should be selling. I'm not going to check his website to see, but that's what Rob claimed. Yeah. Uh, Bad news. So, uh, $2 million. I mean, let's be honest. Nick wouldn't have lost like $4 million of investor money before we hit it big. So we could see a $5 billion hotshot company come back if everybody in the world starts using it at the same time. But yeah. I don't know. I'm skeptical. Maybe it took a million for the label and a million for the... That's it. Just the label. And yeah. <laughs> no, I really don't get it. I don't know. To keep the refrigerator hot One of the concerns that came up i love the constructive criticism the sharks give so let's talk about them uh kevin's you already mentioned lucidly that if you can't make money in 36 months it's a hobby if it's a business you got to shoot it robert herjavec hey in japan they must not have 24-hour coffee shops i just keep driving if i really want coffee i thought that was on sure. the money fair uh, Chris Saka, Blue Bottle is my investment. I think that gave him a really easy way to get out without hurting this guy's feelings. And Blue Bottle apparently is one of the largest growing franchises for coffee, which I also didn't know because I don't drink it. Yeah, I've never heard. I'm out, but I like you. I'll give it a test. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I know. I mean, that could be, that could have been it. Well, I mean, like, well, if it's not for sale, then it's still not for sale, I guess, even in the theaters. Maybe <laughs> some still a landmark. Or maybe Mark has his own hot box at home for his personal consumption. <laughs> maybe. You yeah, never know. About that. Uh, but I did like, he did the same thing that the, uh, the champion guys did, Rent Like a Champion, where he said, oh, that'd be great, Mark. And what about the MAF Stadium? Could we do that too? And Mark said, that rock is going to roll back down and squish you. Be real careful. <laughs> So, and that was actually my favorite part. Kevin was on a roll on this one. This The name of the segment is either Sunk Cost Fallacy or Man Hill Rock, which he did at the end. I was dying because in Greek mythology, to punish a man in perpetuity, you push a rock up the mountain, you get to the top, and then you realize you're still at the bottom. So you start over again. That's what you're doing, my friend. You're at the bottom of the mountain. Uh, and Chris Saka said he couldn't tell if he was asking for money or therapy. I was in stitches. I was laughing hysterically. <laughs> except for the fact that the guy's out $2 million. Lori Grenier had the best line of the night, though. Sincerity, honesty, authenticity. Do you remember what she said to him? No. She said, you know what? This is one of those times where I wish there were six outs. And I went, yes. Oh, Lori, yes. You yeah. not sugarcoat it. Try to make him feel better in her beautiful dress. She was in my gut. I feel like this is not going to work. And at some point, you have to stop the bleeding. All of us are out, and the sixth out should be you. You need to stop. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I mean, if Lori tells you, because Kevin tells almost everyone, right. <laughs> that, you know, but Kevin's if Lori's going to tell you. Lori's Paula Abdul. She tells him to keep dreaming, keep hoping, yeah. and never come back. So I don't have to speak to you again after you leave. And no, no. 
nothing happened. All right. So hot shot. It's going on the wall of fame. All right. Um, next up, wind catcher. Wind catcher. Can before you tell me your thoughts, I just want to say this is one of the more surprising segments and more entertaining ones compared to my expectations when I saw this guy and the wind catcher. So what are your observations? What I would think? agree with that. Um, I thought, okay, so when I, a couple years ago, I lived in Memphis and worked for this company called Mad Science, and it was actually similar to that STEM thing at the end, but we would go around, and one of the things we would do is um, blow into the wind socket thing and show how you could blow it up really quickly and taught about entrainment and things like that, so when he started doing it, I was like, I know what this is, this is awesome. But um, one thing that bothered me combined, that's hilarious. You knew like both of these ideas. You should have been pitching them both. Well, I mean, I didn't know you could use it for anything other than like <laughs> teaching children about entrainment. But when he kept saying that it sucks the air in, so it's basically you're sucking the air in. I kept hearing my high school science teacher say, nothing in nature sucks. Nothing in nature sucks. Yeah. You're supposed to say it draws the air in. So that was a little bit of a pet peeve. I kept hearing Miss Shaw in my head. Um, that it was sucking air in, um, but that's a guy thing. I think we love. Well, your teacher was a guy, but we love saying that things suck. We don't believe that they get pulled or pushed in. Right. Well, she was a she was a lady, but so I think, and it's along those same lines. You know, like it, you know, nothing in nature sucks because it's kind of a bad word, especially in high school. Um, <laughs> but at least for us in South Carolina, yeah, we maybe, right. maybe not for you. <laughs> it was a Christian. It was a Christian school, so. <laughs> Um, but I thought that the idea was cool and I don't know, I thought it went really weird when he started talking about licensing it for like a donut after you have a baby. So <laughs> I thought that was just like a weird idea to like dream up. Like I'm going to make a camping bed and then I'm going to license it. So when you can't sit down after you've given birth, that would be perfect. I guess he didn't, I mean. I could hear the women standing up and applauding in their living rooms. All it was just, I just thought it was weird, though. I don't know. But I had C-section, so I don't know. Maybe I don't, like, get it. But I couldn't imagine. I don't know. It just you was still weird. need an inflatable donut pillow, even for your C-section. Maybe even the hemorrhoid pillow, which he also said he didn't want them using. The right. I don't know. Just the whole, like, thought of all of that. It was just a weird picture. I just – it was just weird. But – and then he's writing on his hand. And my four-year-old was in here watching, and he kept going – why is he writing on his hand? You're not supposed to write on your hand. He, he was like, it was like really bothering him. Um, but the shark seemed to think it was endearing to a point, which yeah, I I'm, thinking, I'm like, why haven't I seen anyone do this before? Like tons of people do that. Right, maybe they I don't. know. I know. Cause they don't usually have paper. No one ever really writes anything down. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of i would say it was kind of weird oh weird. shoot I wrote yes, backwards. exactly <laughs> exactly uh, so my first thought was this guy kind of blows uh, <laughs> you've been waiting a long time to say that i know my wife told me not to say that i'm like well <laughs> why well, it sucks a lot so he doesn't okay so my main observation i just watched the prophet started again this week and i you like the prophet right have we talked about oh him? yeah marcus this? yeah Marcus basically saved CNBC after their rough week that they had after the, uh, after the debate. But <laughs> there's something happened during that episode where he was dealing with these people who had natural pet food, right? And their product is up here and everyone else's product is down there. And yeah. they made a comment about how they don't want to sell certain products that would make them feel like they're selling out or compromising their brand. And Marcus went off on him and said, you don't get to decide. The customer gets to decide. Like, don't tell the customer... Uh, he just went on this rant about how you have the product and you have your standard. If they meet your standard, let the customer decide what's best for them. That's what came into my head when I heard him say, and you nailed it. They're like, hey, you could make all these other products. Like it would be in the hospital. He's like, yeah, I don't see this. I don't want this on a pregnancy donut, you know, that's inflatable or some hemorrhoid pillow or something. And I'm thinking, this is a crackpot mad scientist. Like you don't get to this, I guess in a thing. Theory not to sell those things, but you don't know where the unicorn is. You don't know uh, you're selling camping beds for hundred bucks a piece. Well, that's cool. Like that's not the pot at the end of the rainbow, and you don't know what it is. And that's right. clear from watching this. So I thought that was. I wish Marcus had been there to be like, dude, are you serious right now? Like, let's get this out of your hands as quickly as possible. And I think that's what Kevin was trying to get to with his really interesting venture deal. But that's always interesting when someone says, look, this is my invention, and this is what people are going to use it for. Even if it's better for all these other things, I don't care. That's weird to me. We're not doing that. So 
I, I can't relate with that. Like, it's not how my brain works. What about you? Well, I mean, if they're if they're gonna write you a check, I mean, come on, <laughs> like it's not it's not that personal. I mean, I understand that you want to protect it and it's your baby and it's your brand, but this doesn't really seem like a brand thing that would be tied to him for the rest of his life. So, you know, when it's your brand is your name, you have to be a little more careful. But you know, get something that an insurance you could bill an insurance company for. I mean, like gold mine. <laughs> I mean, if they're using it to quick inflate flat tires from drug dealers that are crossing the border trying to get away from the cops, that's one thing. Or if they're using it to beat like Indian orphans over the heads and, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's like they're in hospitals. <laughs> they like went like way out there like, oh, I never even thought of that. <laughs> well, he's got this moral objection to like, I don't want my product under some pregnant woman's backside after she's been <laughs> labor. I mean, give me a break. Well, who would, hi. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I'm like, dude, you blow air into it. That's what it's like. Come on, let's pretend it's not something that it isn't. It's a cool way to inflate in a hurry. Let the uh, that was my thought. He so Kickstarter in May 2013. I don't remember how much he raised. I think it was around 165,000. And then he said, "Well, how much? How much does it cost to make?" He's like, "Well, I don't want to reveal that." Like, oh, this is going to be awesome. Yeah. I love when people do that. I forgot he did that because by the end they were all in love with him, and I thought they were going to slaughter him. Yeah, I thought Kevin was going to use him, you know, as juggling pins. And all of a sudden, I've got a list here of the longest. I think the longest offer sheet that I've ever seen. On a Dude, shark look tank. How official you are! Wow. I know, right? This is a this is a high class operation. So, <laughs> it's actually yeah, watching the show as a job now, which I never anticipated. Well, let's see. <laughs> it's like scribbly. <laughs> Go ahead, put it back up, and you got to talk so we can see you. Well, it's oh, okay. So I don't. I was probably all spelled wrong. <laughs> Did four year old do that, or was that you? <laughs> That's really me. <laughs> I was yeah. <laughs> I was nursing the baby and writing notes at the same time though. So baby was writing. Okay, well that's a talented baby. I make him props. <laughs> so <laughs> one handed. <laughs> I could never multitask. If I was breastfeeding, I was solely focused on the breast. I didn't ever have time. You would have no life then. <laughs> well, no, that was my life, and I was happy. Uh, <laughs> I don't even think I actually breastfed, to be honest. But um, oh, but, you mean I thought you meant if you were a mom and you were nursing, you would only do. No, no. If I was in. If you're a baby. Yeah, or <laughs> adolescent, adult, or a grown man. Either way. Uh, so he did say $99.95 retail, 60% margins, but he wouldn't tell him the cost. And I thought, this is this is going away real quick. So let's talk about the concerns. Kevin O'Leary, don't you want to license this rather than build your own company? Which obviously that would make a lot of sense because you get that first big win and you're free. Kevin Podcast, I'm sure you've heard it. He said, get that first win and you're free. You never have to scoop ice cream or scrape the floor. You can do whatever, oh, right. and that's the goal. Uh, and he also said the biggest guys in your industry are going to hate you, or you could license to them, get mailbox money, and make them love you more. And he basically said, no, thanks. Where's the fun in that? And I thought, this guy is interesting. Like, I am not expecting the things I'm hearing right now, so I got to change my expectations. And then Kevin called him the single guy in the basement. So... <laughs> Anyway, what did you have any other observations of it? Because I just thought this is someone who doesn't think at all like me, and he's writing on his hand, and he's very confident, and he walked out yeah. of there yeah. with, with a deal. Yeah, but I also want to talk about that. So, oh, ooh. Um, real quickly, Kevin O'Leary, two hundred K is ventured at six percent royalty until I get eight hundred thousand back plus three percent equity, just for the effort and for me being Mister Wonderful. And he said, "So wait a minute, I have to pay you the money back starting immediately, four times as much as you gave me." And you're taking equity. How does that make sense? And everyone's laughing and laughing. <laughs> We're near 200K for 15%. Chris Saka wants to come in and tell the story of all the new products and new markets. And he wants to do it at 200K for 20% with Lori. Ryan says, no. Now I'm like, this guy's awesome. I didn't even think, he, I thought he was a weirdo. And now he's my hero. He just <laughs> said no to Chris Saka. Uh, Robert Herjavec, 200,000 for 10%. Exactly what... Uh, Ryan asked for, and again, Robert gets kicked to the curb. How do you feel about Robert and all the beatings he's been taking lately? I mean, is it I feel him? bad for him when he gets sort of like the deal gets snaked from him. I don't know. I like him. <laughs> he's one of my favorites. He says he's, he's super competitive. He's a good looking dude, and yet he's kind of like the the sharks. Like what he says, I'll give you exactly what you want. Ryan's like, oh, cool. So what were we talking about? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Robert's got to be just simmering. Uh, so Chris Sock and Lori Grenier will go in together 200,000 for 15%. So now you're getting even, like not quite the equity that Robert offered, but you're getting everything you want. Ryan asked for a $10 million line of credit. I was like, who is this guy? This is amazing. And they even asked him if his, what his sales were. He's like, well, if they were millions, I wouldn't be here right now. I just thought, I love this. He's breaking all the rules and it's totally working. Robert Herjavec says, look, I'll even fund your purchase orders. You don't need 10 million in credit. I'll just fund them. Okay, you got my word on it. Oh, yeah, thanks, man. Anybody else have anything they want to tell me? <laughs> Mark Cuban, I'll give you 200,000 for 8% plus your PO funding. That's what you want, right? Isn't that what you asked for? And he kind of... He goes, cut some stuff out because he didn't accept the offer. But then Robert Herjavec, I'll go down to six and a half percent plus fund your purchase orders better than you offered again. Oh, who, what's your name again? Who are you? Like, oh, poor Robert. Weren't you on Dancing with the Stars? <laughs> right? Yeah. Are you, what are you going to, you going <laughs> to dance for us when you sell the product? Like, <laughs> at this point, I actually want Robert to say, what can I do to change, convince you to do a deal with me? And I, I'm curious what he would have said because his offer was the best. He was the one who said, I'll give you funding, which everyone else jumped on. And still nothing. His hair looks amazing. His suit is perfectly tailored. <laughs> What's nothing to do with him. Kevin still keeps jumping in. So much equity. So much equity. I'll take it down to 1%. And then uh, Lori says 200000 for 5%. No Chris Saka. Plus I'll do your PO funding. And here's the deal. I know you're a lady and Lori did this whole speech tonight about being in a special group called women. But... <laughs> I, I don't get this at all. Like, I don't. Chris Saka is the most successful venture capitalist of our century. And Lori made a low ball deal. Maybe it's because I do the podcast. Like, I'm pretty sure that deal went nowhere. What do you think? Um, I don't know. Do you think maybe he just had visions of QVC or something? Because, I mean, it could be the kind of thing that you could sell infomercial-ish. Because it needs a little bit of explaining. You can't just pop it into the store. You have to explain how you have to hold it and blow into it and all that kind of stuff. But I don't know. Well, to Lori's credit, she is a product inventor, developer. Yeah. You know, so there are other products, but I'm looking at this and thinking, okay, so if you're going to develop additional products, that's one thing. I, but what I notice on this list, and like sometimes, is these offers went down every single time someone spoke. And then he asked for more t on two occasions. And even Mark Cuban jumped in, 8% plus PO. Robert Herjavec, 6.5%. So it sounds like he had a number in his mind. He was going to take the best valuation, whoever the partner was. And the thing, maybe Lori said, you did your homework. You know that I'm on QVC. You know I do all these products. But if he did his homework, he knows that there's a good chance this deal doesn't close. And Lori lowballed at everybody to get the deal done. I think she wanted to win. I don't think that deal goes anywhere. And he should have uh -huh. I'm wondering if he actually wanted the deal is what I'm saying. So if we follow up in six months, I'd be surprised if they're still working together because she made him a deal that was too good, way better than everybody else. And I just, I don't see it. 5% could be wrong. Yeah. Hope I am. Um, anyway, and that's because I wrote an article the other day that uh, I meant that was on Shark Tank. And with all the work I've done over the last two years, that's the one that's gotten me by far the most press. So much so that Clay Newbill actually had to respond to it because he kept getting asked about it. I'm sure he couldn't care less about discussing this. But he said, it's not accurate. It's a small sampling. It's actually closer to, you know, two thirds do go through. And Mark Cuban recently said that he's got 46 deals that he's closed as of this season, which is more than all the other sharks combined. So I got my little calculator out. It's here somewhere. And I started doing numbers and I figured out if you only count seasons four through six and which is where most of my data is from, but I've interviewed over a hundred of the best entrepreneurs. And by the way, the best ones are also the most likely to have a deal. And I figured out after punching a ton of numbers that if Mark's statement is accurate, unless the other sharks did the exact same amount he did, it's less than 50% of deals that close at best, at best. Oh, wow. This and say It's obvious Lori wanted to get the deal done, but when she wakes up in the morning, is she going to want this for 5%? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it might have been like the thrill of the hunt. But then I do want to say that then she stood up and you saw her whole dress. So that was the highlight of that one for me. But no matter how it ends, <laughs> like it's not going to get any better than that. <laughs> yes. Okay, so that the, the last season she was wearing that black dress with the diamond and on Facebook and Instagram, that's the one that was catching heat for. What did you think of like the Supergirl sideways diamond that she had in her dress? 
tonight? Did she have that? No, no, no. It's like all last season. The one she wore that was black. Oh, that one. Oh, breastplate. Yeah, I mean, I think she always looks awesome. I never did. They were they saying it was like too scandalous or something for Shark Tank? Like I said earlier, like they would women just want to talk about her dress, and I noticed there's always a discussion about that top part being cut out. And as a man, I go, all right, well, who cares? Like I, I think she looks good, but I'm not a, I'm not Christian Dwar. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think she always looks awesome. I just, I don't know. She just always does. I liked the dress. I like this one because it has the way the pink, it's the way the designer does the pink. It really makes you look curvy and like thinner. It's almost like an optical illusion without the skinny mirror. You can, it's just the way they do it. It, I don't know. It was cool. It's just cool. There's all this stuff going on that I didn't even realize on the show. I'm, I'm looking at it, but I'm not seeing it. I feel like I'm right. watching like I'm watching a Christopher Nolan movie. Like you just enlightened my mind so much. About <laughs> I'm going to pay more attention for now. On. Yeah. Oh, and you told me, you emailed me, you said you were really sad Barbara wasn't on the show. I'm sorry. I was. I know. Yeah. I mean, I just, I don't know. I just like her. She's just, I just do. I just like her. I mean, how can you not like Barbara? But she got a little thrashed in the promo by Kevin about not being able to count. Did you see that? Did that offend you? Did it make you mad? No, no. I mean, I feel like they're probably all just like, besties and they just play on tv to keep the ratings up i don't know i don't know if that's true or not but i just mm -hmm. think some because of them like, are not besties by the way oh they're not oh well don't ruin my dream <laughs> kind of do that sometimes but kevin and barbara kissed on tv more than yeah. that yeah, and damon he was dressed up like like barbara at least on facebook today so i don't know if that was like an old halloween picture or he was dressed up like her and so did you, I don't know if you saw, she shared it. She said, today's a great day to dress up like your idol or something. I think that was last, I didn't see today's picture, but that happened last year. And um, you notice when the sharks aren't on the show, they always, they're on social media being like, well, here's what I'm doing when I'm not on the show. So can't right. uh, swag essentials. I don't have her picture. And you know what? I think I actually missed her segment last season because I don't remember seeing it, which is a crime for me because I've seen them all. I could not remember her. Did you see swag essentials when she went on originally? Um, I kind of, I don't watch it as well as you do, but I sort of remembered it because I remember the acronym was kind of cool. Um, cause swag stands for something. It is cool. It is. And I just, I don't know. I thought the B roll on this was just like hilarious. It was like awesome. Like, I don't know if you've ever had to do like B roll and stuff. And, um, I had to do something for something that was being filmed. Facebook actually was filming me and, my, and they kept asking my husband and I to like open the oven together, like over like five times. And so I, I don't know. I just always think B roll can be like really funny. And I felt like hers was really funny too, because it was like, all right, can we get 150 more orders? Yay. I don't, it just kind of cracked me up the way it was. So they probably did that 15 times to get the shot. Yeah. Oh, yes. And then it's like close up and then it's far back and then, you know, catch the light. Yes. Yeah. And I actually think that's the reason Beyond the Tank is kind of, I don't know if it's coming back or what the deal is, but it's, it's too orchestrated for me. Like, yeah, people in my audience who really like the podcast will say it's better than the show because they learn so much, but the show it's contrived in the fact that they cut it together, but the action on scene is not reshot. It's not redone. It's not co oh, that's yeah. And the Beyond the Tank was. I mean, it's all, yeah. And in fact, when you talk about that, it's funny because uh, do you play music like you piano player by chance? No. Well, you're aware that when you go to play it, there's a little word up there that tells you how to play it, like the speed or the pace or the tempo. Oh, or, right. Yes. And they make, they've got these great words that they use. And I just picture the director when you're opening the oven, he's like, bigger. I'm more staccato. Like those are the words they use to direct you. <laughs> this is how I feel when you're doing that. Yeah, yes, yeah. You know, when you're watching it, like, this is totally fake. All right. So, <laughs> all right, I have this strange suspicion that you and I are going to have a disagreement about this last one because I have some unkind words. And you know what? I shouldn't say that. They were, they're lovely. They're really pretty and they're smart. And this segment was kind of a disaster for me. What do you think? Um, I mean, don't, don't I let don't... me slay you. Give me, a, give me two straight. You haven't said anything I disagree with. Like, the thing is cool. They are pretty. I don't, I mean, I think this is perfect franchise. It just, I don't know. I just think that it is. I think that they could pop this up and teach summer camp all over the country. It's no, it's a good idea as a franchise. I could, I went to summer and then afterwards, I remember having a horrible time and hating every second of it. 
And then oddly, I guess it's like childbirth for men because the, like as the years went on, I were missing it and wanting to go back. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there, but um, this kind of reminds me of Skinny Mirror. I was a little harsh on Skinny Mirror. She got thrashed on social media last week. And then I sent out my first weekend update for like current sharks and not annual updates. I said, hey, I'd love to get your thoughts on your airing and how things went afterwards. She's the only one that answered of all of them. Like, yeah, I'd love to tell you. Let's get on. I'm like, oh no, don't watch the segment. I was really mean. and <laughs> uh, So here's the deal with these two. They went to, okay, observations. They said that fewer people have an idea of how things work. And my first thought was, wait a minute. Where are kids going for eight hours a day for like 18 years? Where, where, are the, where is this place that we're going to learn how fewer things work? And I was so glad that Chris Saka later said, you know, I think schools are really going to latch onto this because what they're doing is basically saying kids who go to school all day and come out of school at 18 are pretty stupid. And I kind of agree with her on that. But uh, that was a, that's just something I noticed. And uh, beyond that, there's one clip I have to play because I'm worried I'll forget if I don't do it right now. And that's when Chris Saka gave them an offer. Again, I should mention like the most successful venture capitalist of all time gave them an offer for 150,000 for 25 percent. They asked for 150,000 for 15 percent. So we're not too far off, right? And this is what happened. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Well, you still have two sharks. You've got Lori and you've video. got Chris. Uh, for me, I think a lot of the challenges here really go back to valuation because this is a business that doesn't have the traditional scale of a tech company. True. That said, I deeply believe in your mission. I think schools are going to start waking up and realizing they need more of this in the schools. They're going to be reaching out to you. There is a big thirst for materials like this. So what I'd like to do is offer you 150K for 25% of the company. Here comes, here comes. We I do have the utmost respect for that offer, and we do appreciate it, um, and we would love to consider it. We do believe. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, that was bad. That was really bad. I felt like it was like he was asking her out, and she's like, oh, that's so sweet. Maybe we could get together for coffee sometime or something. Like, sort of like blowing him off, and like, it's sort of like, oh, bless your heart. Like, that's what we would say. That was, that's a really good analogy. Yeah, she's like, uh, this happens to me five times a day, and I'm going to try to let you down easy. Yeah. Oh, bless your heart. Yeah. You're, you're such a nice guy. I don't deserve you. I really don't. Christine. Yeah. I don't want to ruin our friendship. She doesn't want to ruin her friendship with him, you know? That's well said. I didn't. Yeah. I, that's a perfect example. And it got worse as it went on. And this is why I have a problem with it. So these are two people. She's got this internship. She's worked with Raytheon. She worked on a satellite. I mean, they built themselves off to be so smart. And then he does that. And she comes off as a robot, as an attractive half Indian robot. And she's lovely. And I thought, no, 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 please don't let this happen. And it got worse for me. It went downhill from there. So you should need to say something before I say something I'll regret. Yeah. Well, I also, I, I kind of don't like when people say this is great for women because we're women and women need this. So we're all women and that's why we should be friends. It's just because we're all women because it, I don't know, they're trying to become more equal, but you're totally separating yourself out. It's either cool or it's not cool. And whether you're a woman or not kind of doesn't, I don't know. I don't think it should play into it as much as they were making it play into it. Um, I think the fact that they were pretty was more like, we're pretty and we're smart is, I don't know, that's, that's more of a stigma, I think, now than I'm a woman and I'm smart. But I don't know, that's just me. Yeah. And by the way, Chris Saka totally. So Lori, and I see this come from a mile away. Lori's going to jump in and she's going to tell him how much she relates with them because she's <laughs> not there to steal that thunder. I think I have this queued up. I'm not sure, but this is to me where it got really, really weird. Let me see how it sounds right now. Here's the thing. I'd like to hear a counter because I love Lori I, and I have deep respect for her QVC and retail connections, but that's not what we're talking about here. And so I think I have a unique skill set to bring to the table with you guys. And so I'd love to hear what you're coming back with. I just want to share something. Oh, come a on. A personal anecdote about okay. what STEM means to you because I, I would listen to that. I would listen to that. About a robot you built when you're eight just, years old, I would totally just hear like that out. Kevin. Oh my goodness. Come on. Right. Just like Kevin, I'm part of a very exclusive and prestigious club. <laughs> I'm a woman. I think you just called Kevin a woman. Is that what just happened? No. 
But no, you know how he's always like, I'm in that wine club, so I can sell cheese or I can sell beef jerky or I can sell whatever. Yeah, I need to, I have a, I'm making a t-shirt with that thing printed on it, by the way. Yeah, so I think that's what she was trying to say, like, you know, but I don't know. And I felt like though, I mean, that was hilarious the way he was talking to her, but I felt like it was that t-shirt that's like, that's a great story. Now go make me a sandwich. You know, have you seen that shirt? Yeah. Cool story, bro. Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, and this is the thing. I don't like it. It happens with women on the show a lot. Uh, I can think of a couple examples. And I get why you do it. You want to win the deal. But I don't think people care. Like, And here's the other thing. With Stan, there's this big push that we've got to have. Chris said earlier, I've got two girls, and it's a male-dominated industry. And But it's like in politics, they do this all the time. If we don't have a president who's black, if we don't have a president who's a woman, are we missing out on something? Like is, are things a lot worse now than they could be if we had someone with different genitals or skin color? And to me, that is insane. So here's the deal. With STEM, it's been dominated by men, sure, traditionally, because women didn't used to be in the workplace. But you're not just saying we need more women in technology. We need more women in science. We're saying we need women to shift from what either they want to do or what they are doing to something that they're not doing. And I'm a common soul guy in ecom, uh, I'm big time economic, uh, economics, I can't even say the word. So obviously I'm a genius <laughs> and opportunity cost. People are doing things they want to do. They're inclined to do. They feel strongly about, and we're saying, no, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be doing something different. And it's not like getting them off the farm to create medicines and take us to the moon. It's, uh, getting out of certain industries and going to others, whether they're at home teaching, taking care of their kids or whether they're teachers or whether they're doing something they really love. Nah, that's not good enough. You need to go and you need to focus on engineering. And I just wonder if, if that's supposed to happen, it will happen. Like we don't need to make it happen or force it happen or legislate it to happen or give subsidies so it'll happen. That's my personal opinion. So this, every time I hear that, it's kind of weird. I'm like, Chris, I hope your daughters grow up and become venture capitalists like you because you have it in your blood. I don't want to tell an industry of people that are going to college right now that this is what they need to study because we tried that already and now we have a trillion dollars of debt and people graduate from college that don't have any jobs. That's because we told them that's what they should be doing. And right. we're kind of wrong. Like it didn't, hasn't really worked out spectacularly in our day and age. So sorry, rant over. No, I totally agree. Totally agree. And in the healthcare industry, my sister-in-law is a um, physician's assistant and she graduated like two years ago and she talks about how there's been such a shift where in those classes there weren't as many women and now they're predominantly women in med school and becoming in these higher level medical, you know, professions. They're not just nurses or not that nursing is less, but it's just different. You know, it was definitely kind of separated. And so like you were saying, it naturally will happen as women or men start to follow their passion. I mean, the same thing with the aviation industry, you know, pilots were male and flight attendants were female, but now it's not that way anymore. People who want to be pilots because of their personality and they're wired that way, they become pilots and people who want to be flight attendants become flight attendants. So it just naturally goes in the, that direction. You're right. Yeah. It's and for me, it, and I'm in a moral fashion. Like my wife stays home. She chose to, we have amazing kids and that's all on her because I had nothing to do with it. Like they're going to be standouts and whatever they do and they have her to thank for it. I just think that that's like the most important job we have is to make sure that our kids aren't screw ups. And the thing is in our day and age with technology, some of the most successful women, business people slash entrepreneurs I know are women who are doing, um, I don't want to say this so that it sounds bad. It just is what it is. They're blogging, they're creating products that they're selling online, they're online entrepreneurs, they're doing things where yeah. they can still juggle all their other responsibilities. They're not getting on a jumbo jet and flying around the world for a week at a time. And I like there is a cost to that to society. When you have more women graduating college than men, when you have more women studying uh, tr traditionally men led fields, then you don't need those men anymore. They have now they're displaced and have to find something else to do. Well that's cool, but is that good just because it's happening? Don't know. Let's, it's going to take a while to figure that out. And like a lot of things, hopefully we won't, haven't realized we've made a big mistake messing with the natural state of things for a long, long time. So there are people who are going to watch this probably their eyes are going to bleed, but, <laughs> but actually I've got someone who I want to have on the podcast. She got, she didn't even get a call back from shark tank. She has a business. She's doing like quarter million dollars a quarter making breastfeeding covers. Her husband just graduated medical school and oh. If he's lucky, he'll make quarter million a year, like the end of next year, because he's got to do all this other stuff and he's got to start his own business. She'll probably make $2 million next year. Wow. She's breastfeeding covers that she sewed herself for a year and she's selling them on Instagram. That's it. 
Cool. She's going to be a ten million dollar company in like a year or two. In my opinion, she's still a mom. She's still raising her kids. Her kids yeah. go to school. She's home with them, and she runs her little cloud business. Like that to me is amazing because her husband's going to end up working for her. So, <laughs> well, that needs to be like she should be focusing on an engineering degree or getting into STEM. Like, right. Yeah. And that's almost our life. I mean, not the numbers, but that's what I do. So I run my business from home when the kids are at preschool a couple mornings a week. And, you know, it would be awesome if one day my husband works for me too. So, I mean, <laughs> Go get him. so we'll see. But, you know, it is, it is special because, you know, I don't, but I'm not an entrepreneur because I felt like that was what I was supposed to do or because I felt pressure. It was because it was something I couldn't not do. Like I just started a business because it's just the way I'm wired. Um, I didn't really necessarily set out to do it. And now I'm of course passionate about it, but you know, it's kind of the same thing. Like you're saying, I didn't wake up one day and say, I have to be an engineer so that I can be, you know, a proud woman. I just, it just naturally came. Yeah. I mean, I think for me too, it's like they, you have to empower women and you have to show that they're equal. I'm like equal. I'm not equal to my wife. Are you freaking kidding me? Like, there's <laughs> nothing out there that I can do better than she can. And most of my male friends are the same way and they'll admit it even like, no matter, it's a joke to us. So to act like there's this big thing that women aren't equal, I'm like, eh, there's a couple things I do better. Like in the hunter gatherer sense, like spearing wild game, trapping, you know, skinning animals, those things I probably, she might've had me on a few of them, but basically the physical grunt labor and disciplining the kids, I got those covered. And then podcasting, she stutters. So she's scared to do that. And that's it. Everything else she's better at. So she does the most important business and be awesome at that and relate with other similar women and build up those industries. It's so awesome. So I hear this drivel about we have to push women in and push other people out that whole title nine thing. I'm like, this is insanity. We don't have to do any of that. We just have to let them serve the greatest good they can at the highest level they can. And it's going to help everyone. I mean, that's game theory. They made a movie about that. So anyway, I got to stop ranting. I, I want to talk about what happened here when Robert said, I'm excited for you guys, but I'm out. Uh, Mark Cuban, you have a magnificent goal, but it's too open-ended, not the right fit for me out. Mark actually said in that same article that the hardest thing on Shark Tank to do is to come up with creative ways to go out, just kind of like American Idol. Like that is the hardest thing. Uh, I don't like it. You're, I'm out. You don't want to say that. Chris Saka, evaluation. There's really no scale. I believe in your mission. I think the schools will wake up. So he makes them the offer and they give him that robotic answer back, which to me was at 20%. So what does Chris do? He comes back and he has some words for him and says, basically, look, I'll do it for 150,000 for 22 and a half percent. So what he's doing is saying, if you don't realize that I'm more valuable to this than Lori, and he made some comments about going on QVC. He said, you know what? You didn't hear in her offer uh, anything other than what you're going to do on QVC or retail because that's not with the business you're in. So I'll give you 22 and a half percent. And what did they do? They took Lori's offer. I know. Oh, did you want me to say that? Yeah. <laughs> Did you remember? <laughs> yeah, no, they did. Yeah, they took, I mean, yeah, they did. Girl power. Girl power. And um, uh, and Chris said, okay, cheers. And, you know, they're all, oh, good deal, great deal. Mark's like, nice job, guys. Chris said, okay, cheers. And what he was saying actually was, you're the dumbest, smartest girls I've ever met. <laughs> and that's what I heard him say. Maybe he didn't actually say it, but he's like, wait a minute. Okay. Science technology forefront. I told you I was passionate about it. I have daughters and you just went with retail QVC for your franchise scale business. Okay. And they went out and said, you know what? Lori didn't even hesitate. She has retail. She has tech. She has it all. Is it not obvious they wanted a million dollar valuation? Like that's all they cared about was getting to that number and they would take anyone who gave it to them. I think Chris in his mind was saying via telepathy, you're retarded. I can't believe that just happened. <laughs> yeah. No, because I thought, I mean, and I don't think that Chris was any less passionate or in, like, he got the vision, too. He wasn't saying, like, I have the skills, this could make a bunch of money. I mean, he talks about his daughters. I don't think, you know, I think that he had the heart mission as well as Lori. So for them to say that they went with Lori just because of the mission, I, I don't think, I don't believe that. Yeah. She had said, well, they did their homework. I'm like, yeah, they probably didn't. But he, oh no, I'm sorry. He mentioned earlier, he goes, what do you need help with? What do you need a shark for? And they mentioned this list of things, this litany of items. And that's when he said, you know, I didn't hear in there. I didn't hear anything about QVC and hear anything about retail, you know, distribution or shelf placement or whatever. Didn't hear any of that. And 
I'm sure Lori didn't like it, but I don't know. I just, the whole thing about girl power confuses me totally because I think it has nothing to do with that at all. <laughs> and they've, you know, there was an episode a couple of weeks ago where they sold, well, my family gets together, you know, once a year. And she's like, well, my family gets together at QVC. And Mark goes, yeah, I eat dinner with my people every day at the dinner table because it's retarded. And that's how they ended up. <laughs> I, this is th maybe this is why they're not like in mathematics because mathematics sense like there's nothing mathematical here at all. I don't know. That sounds sexist. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but I, Chris, that look on his face, and I just my wife from walking in, I'm like you haven't seen the segment yet. She's like, no, is it good? I'm like, uh, no comment. I'm gonna go talk to Abby. I'm gonna go over. <laughs> Me up. But I wish the best of luck to them. They've made a bunch of money. I yeah. agree with you. There's, uh, there were internet cafes. Now there's YouTube cafes for content creators. There's co-sharing. I think this engineering space actually could grow some legs and would be a good idea. I just, Chris and I wouldn't agree on anything politically, but the guy knows what he's doing and he's, you know, he's got his hands in all the right pockets, knows all the right people. I just don't get it at all. Mm -hmm. so, um, man. So that's it. That's all four yeah. of them. Uh, tell people about your Facebook group, where they can find you, what do you do specifically, and then we'll sign off. Okay, so you can find me on Facebook, um, Abby Unger, A-B-B-I-E-U-N-G-E-R is how you spell it. My, um, This is my book, Make Money with Facebook Groups. You can find it on Amazon. This is the physical copy, but I, there, it's a Kindle too. And um, if you want to become a flight attendant, that's the company that I own, Flight Attendant Career Connection. So I coach aspiring flight attendants. And you can find that on Facebook too. I have a Facebook group that has almost 19,000 people in it. Ooh, and so, so it, yeah, it's big. It's a big one. Um, lots of, and it's a fun place. So if you're interested in doing a Facebook group, you can request to join and pop in and just see how we interact with each other. If you're just curious or if you want to be a flight attendant, then you definitely should join the Facebook. All right. Well, since I've already pissed off everyone with my sexist comments, what are, what's the buzz in the flight attendant industry with all the male flight attendants now? Because that didn't used to be the case. I mean, now when I go, I'm looking around going, what happened to the world I used to live in? <laughs> well, yeah, um, that's pretty sexist. No, but it used to be against, it used to just be women. That was the, they were stewardesses and you had to be a woman. You had to be under 32. You couldn't be married. You couldn't have any children and they weighed you before every trip. So it was a totally different world. They mm -hmm. weighed flight attendants until the nineties. So that was one of the last things that went away. Um, now you just have to fit in the jump seat. You have to be able to fit <laughs> into the jump seat that's to be a flight attendant. <laughs> That's not sexist, but that's evil and hateful. Yeah. So if you're, what? The passengers don't have to be able to fit in the seat. Why does the flight attendant have to be able to? Well, I don't know. I guess you don't want a flight attendant like rolling down the aisle during a crash or an emergency. But, you know, now you can be married. You can have children. You can be over 32. You can be a man. There's, you know, a lot of things have changed. But, um, you know, it's. It's just such a personality-based thing, though. If you have the right personality, you're going to be a good flight attendant, you know, whether you're married. Delta, or they don't have to like you at all. Um, that's just my experience on Delta. You don't work for Delta, right? No, no. I don't work for any airline now. So you can talk about all of them. <laughs> this is a flight attendant. But yeah, I'm like, Delta, I think you have to, like, it's kind of like going to Ed to Bevix where the waiters are, like, purposely rude to you and snarky as part of the experience. So no, the flight attendants were, they weren't nice to you? I was traveling a lot and I'm not anymore, but I used to fly all the time. And that was my joke with my friends. I'm like, have you ever had a Delta flight where someone was nice to you? <laughs> well, I had, um, there was a Huffington Post article that I was interviewed for that went viral a few weeks ago. And it was all these pet peeves about flight attendants. And people would get so mad about, you know, why are y'all complaining? Y'all are mean anyways. And just like, they were, it, it was kind of, I thought it was funny. Because people were like, why are you complaining so much? I'm going to complain about your complaining. Let's just all complain together. But I, I don't know. I, the It just sort of is a hard industry, though. I mean, sometimes they have rough days. I'm surprised you never had a nice one. But No, no, I did. Just not on Delta. I had nice ones all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. But not on Delta, really? No, well, I had a friend, a guy I knew that's worked for Delta forever. He's a flight attendant. He had some great stories. Flight attendant stories are awesome. Yeah, I would agree. If a flight attendant trusts you enough to tell you their good stories, like, hang on, they're fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I worked for America West on the ramp for one year when I was out. Oh, yeah. And that was like the most fun year of my life. I mean, just the kind of shenanigans that would happen out there. Now that we're in the 9 11 era, I think maybe it's changed. Back then, like, this place is a circus. Yeah. 
Like it's it's Bruno Bailey out here. It's Cirque du Soleil with less. It, it was awesome. Yeah. Mini blue juice story still makes me laugh hysterically. <laughs> my husband works toilet humor, but if it's blue juice humor, it's funny. In my yeah, opinion. that that's true. My husband works on the ramp. He's a ramp supervisor, so he's he's, oh, he's been on the ramp for a long time. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah, so they yeah they have those kind of stories and you had to babysit guys like me. I feel so bad for him because yeah and yeah and it is a lot of babysitting well, <laughs> and the language the language I don't know were you a big cusser then I know and now we have children that like repeat everything and I'm like oh my we're not like animals we can't just cuss like this all the time yeah yeah it was bad especially on bad I mean there's we're in Phoenix right so there's some hot days on the ramp and I saw fist fights I saw people hit planes with their carts. We had, one, but a lot of it wasn't personnel. One of them was, um, you know, they ship human remains, mm. and went to the back of the plane, and the thing went all the way across the country and back before they figured out where it was. I mean, days like that was an interesting day. I'm thinking, yeah. man, wish you have to load the the human remains the right way so that when it you fly, the everything doesn't like leak out. Yeah, they did that. They checked that off the list, and then they left it on the plane for like. A month. Oh, <laughs> so, well. we got the important stuff. But uh, Abby, I'll definitely link to your Facebook group there. I, I didn't realize the group was so big. That's fantastic. My sister's a flight attendant. I'll tell her to check it out. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. She For enjoyed it. Um, hold on. Allegiant. Oh, nice. Oh, Good. that's great. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. I said good. <laughs> good for her. Well, I was thinking she's home every night, right? They don't do overnights. Yes. Yeah, she is. That's why she took it. Yeah. So, she's home every night except. After the night's win, she's really late and doesn't get home till early in the morning, and then she wishes they did do overnight. But or unless there's a mechanical, which never happens with the Legion. Not with the Legion, no, because their planes are like they're all under fifty years old, so they all work awesome. I think <laughs> yeah, most, most of them. When they're not like catching on fire. Yeah, yeah, they buy them from some drug dealer in Guadalajara, and they just repaint them, and they they work fine. You take all the amenities out of them except for the bathroom so you don't have to worry about like reclining or having stuff to put your f food and laptop on it yeah it, makes it so convenient i bet i bet it's nice work though i mean you just load them on load them off you know not a lot of stuff yeah I, they've they haven't even taken a page out of Delta's book yet. I'm like, with the way you guys do things this greyhound bus methodology that you have why do you even interact with the passengers you just go up and point, and if they ask you questions, you can treat it like a Dave Chappelle skit where you're like, who are you talking to? Why are you even speaking to me? Like, sit down. We're going to be there in three hours. Just shut up. <laughs> they should have like a random Coke product strapped into every chair. You can drink half a can. Like every two flights, they replace the cans. and <laughs> Share it. <laughs> yeah, it's like a little Sharpie line in the center. Like, you get this much Sprite, leave the rest for the next passenger. <laughs> Ew. That's how I feel when I fly Allegiant. Thanks, Allegiant. You're great. <laughs> nice. um, Abby, it's totally cool because now we've virtually known each other for a while. I, like I said, you were one of the first listeners I interacted with, and I remember that because I thought it was awesome. And here yeah. we are catching up with Shark Tank, and I appreciate you joining me for the Shark Tank hangover. But uh, uh, time to go. Time to go. Good night. Right, good night. I'm hit. Bye. Stop.